it is a rocking Friday. We come on the air with New York City all shook up after that really surprising and rare earthquake sending tremors across the Northeast. The strongest quake New Jersey has felt in nearly 250 years. We have stunning video and the after effects coming up. Then the new jobs report coming in hot with historic gains to find the expectations. How will the Fed and voters react to these very strong numbers? Plus the NBC News exclusive on the mounting charges coming for Sean Diddy Combs and now another member of his family as well. And in tonight's original more royal family drama, with another new movie about another infamous and explosive BBC interview with a member of the royal family defending his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. And are you watching the women's final four games tonight? Odds are you'll have a lot of company in what will probably be another record-breaking night for women's college basketball. Our team live outside one of the arenas where it's all going down coming up later in the show. All right, good day, I'm Tom Costello. I am in for Hallie. We come on the air with concerns about safety after that shocking and rare earthquake that rocked parts of the East Coast. It is the strongest quake that the epicenter of New Jersey has seen in nearly 250 years. Take a look. Yeah, you'd be bleeping my words, too. It was a 4.8 magnitude earthquake and centered, centered in Lebanon, New Jersey. That's about 50 miles outside of New York City. People reported feeling the shakes all the way from Philadelphia up to Boston. In one New Jersey town, more than a dozen people evacuated from buildings because of structural damage. You can see right there, the buildings are kind of leaning in right there. Teams are out as we speak across the state, checking to make sure that bridges and roads and buildings and tunnels are all okay. And keep in mind, a lot of them are old, right? Hundreds of years old. As of now, no reports of any injuries. Now, the earthquake triggered ground stops at two major airports in the area, causing several flights to be diverted. One pilot flying into LaGuardia warned his passengers. Take a listen. We're getting updates on your phone about an earthquake in New York. Uh, as of now, we have not been affected by that. Uh, weather in LaGuardia is, is fine, maybe a little shaky from the ground shaking. I know what you're thinking out there on the West Coast. You're thinking, you East Coasters, you're all wimps. Okay, but this is in California. It's so scary for so many people because the East Coast is not known for this kind of thing. And many buildings really aren't built for earthquakes here, raising a lot of concern and questions tonight about structural safety. We have meteorologist Michelle Grossman to break this down for us. But first, let's go to my friend Rahema Ellis, who's on the ground in Jersey. Rahema, my daughter lives in New York City. I got an urgent text message from her this morning, rattled. She was startled. Uh, this doesn't happen very often on the East Coast, right? What are you hearing from folks there in Jersey? You're right, it does not happen often. And the folks here in New Jersey, they were, as you said, rattled by all of this, leaving them to wonder what in the heck is going on. I want you to hear from a woman who's just down the street from where I'm standing right now. She and her family were at home. Listen to what they said about how they felt this earthquake hitting them. It was absolutely unbelievable. How so? So, like, nothing I've ever felt before. I mean, we thought our house was coming down, to be honest with you. You thought your house was coming down? We thought our house was coming down. I, I mean, to the point where the, everybody was screaming in this house. I mean, we just had no idea. I thought that something was exploding from the basement because the walls were trembling. Yeah, so she's saying it felt like something coming up from the ground that was rattling. I was just talking to another resident about 20 miles from here, so she's here uh, watching us, as a matter of fact. Jones said she felt like there was a plane roaring right over her house. That's how much it was rattling her, leaving her unsettled and concerned. Happily, she said nothing was broken. There was no structural damage in her house. And essentially, that's what we're hearing from town officials here. There are no reports of any damages, any injuries of any major sort, but they're watching out for all of it. Tom? You know, the first time I felt one, I, I fell into that 
you know, kind of that stereotypical description. I said it felt like a freight train, but that's what it feels like, right? And our NBC Tumen team, rather, in, in the city there, they received two alerts on their phone, but the first one didn't come for about 30 minutes. Any idea why there was such a delay? I don't know, but we do have a sound, but I'm going to toss to in just a moment about that. But I was one of those residents in New York City, actually sitting in my kitchen and watching MSNBC, and the kitchen started to move, and it left me feeling very uncomfortable. And it was about 20 minutes later that I got this alert on my phone. Listen to what officials in New York City said about the concern some people had that those warnings came 20 to 30 minutes later. Take a listen. I think 20 minutes time to target is pretty fast for public notification. Uh, first off, there's a lot of work we have to do to make sure we're getting confirmation from USGS that this was actually an earthquake, right? There's a lot of things that can cause buildings to shake. Two, we also need to make sure we're putting out the proper guidance. City officials saying they're going to have building inspectors available this weekend for anyone who might feel some concerns about their property. They'll be able to phone in and inspectors will be around to respond. Tom? Yeah, so aftershocks is one big question. Rahima, thank you. Uh, let's bring in meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Uh, and that's one question. Might mm -hmm. we see aftershocks? Second of all, how does this one compare to the 2011 earthquake that hit the Northeast, including here in D.C., right? We had significant damage to the Washington Monument, to the National Cathedral, cracks up and down uh, the facades from both, uh, both of those buildings. Yeah, so I was working in Philly in 2011. That was the first earthquake that I felt. And if you're not used to that sensation, it truly is something you've never felt before, that sliding. It almost feels like the, the earth is just moving under you, not so much the shaking. I felt like a sliding, and that's the plates coming together. So that's the first thing. Now, that, um, that, that earthquake was 5.8 on the magnitude scale, so 10 times more powerful. That's how it's sort of rated with earthquakes. And then in terms of the aftershocks, we've had one pretty much every hour since that 10 o'clock earthquake. So we're going to continue to feel them. The USGS has told us that we will probably feel them over the next day or two. We have a 4% chance of feeling a 5.0 or greater. So on the lower scale in terms of the percentage, statistically speaking, but we have a 48% chance of feeling a 3.0 magnitude or less. So certainly in the cards to feel more aftershocks as we go throughout the next couple of hours. And this is where the epicenter was. It was three miles from Lebanon, as we just heard from Rahema, and also uh, th three miles from four miles from White House Station 4.8 magnitude earthquake earthquake which is notable it's historical a lot of us have not felt this and we were feeling this 300 miles from the epicenter to the south to the north all the way to portions of New England portions to the south as well this is the third strongest uh, earthquake that we felt in New Jersey so this is notable we're going back to the 1700s to 1800s and we have not felt this for many of us in our lifetime 5.3 that was in 1783 that was the strongest and then uh, we're going to continue to watch this, Tom, because we certainly could feel those aftershocks. Back to you. Amazing. Really no significant uh, damage Thankfully. that we know of or injuries, right? So, yeah. all right. Michelle, thank you very much. Sure. We'll keep watching and feeling for anything that comes. Yeah. Overseas now in Taiwan, where rescuers are facing threats of landslides and falling rocks as they try to save people trapped after a powerful earthquake there right off the island's eastern coast. Now, we continue to see dramatic scenes, including a rescuer giving an injured man a piggyback ride out of a cave after he was stuck there for days. Rescuers have been combing mountainous areas like these for anyone left behind in the devastation. Earlier today, crews found two more bodies in the mountains. That brings now to 12, the number of people killed in the 7.4 magnitude quake. More than 1,100 injured, 600 plus trapped, at least 13 are missing. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer on the ground with more for us. We were inside Taroka Gorge National Park today, where for days rescue teams have been working to reach hundreds of people stranded in the mountains. They've been cut off by landslides. Helicopters have been taking supplies to them, things like food and water, to tie them over until they can be airlifted out. Most of them have been trapped at a hotel inside the park where they're said to be safe. But there are still several people who have been reported missing. 
Time is of the essence. That 72-hour window that rescue officials talk about maximizing, it's now beginning to close. Rain has come into the forecast, and the main challenge remains aftershocks. There have been more than 400 of them now and counting. One rescue team leader told us every time there is an alert, they need to retreat. And for the bigger ones, they simply go back to the station. Earthquakes are unavoidable here, but Taiwan has arguably one of the most advanced systems in the world to deal with them. There are cell phone alerts to uh, let people know what's happening, and as, as well as wide public awareness. People just seem to know what to do when an earthquake strikes. There are also strict building codes and lessons learned over the years uh, that have seen several buildings reinforced with steel beams to make them more resistant. You'll see all of the activity at this tilting building uh, behind me. For several days, it's been on the verge of collapse. Officials have made the quick decision that they're going to demolish it. Janice, thank you very much. Uh, also interesting, those nurses ran to the babies rather than running away. President Biden right now, late today, promising more federal aid on the way as part of his tour of the catastrophic bridge collapse in Baltimore. Take a listen. I'm here to say your nation has your back, and I mean it. Your nation has your back. The president also met privately with the families of the six men killed when that massive cargo ship plowed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge 10 days ago. Crews are still working 24-7 to clear the tons of twisted metal and concrete from the waterway. Losing that critical bridge is having a massive impact on travel and on the thousands of blue-collar workers in the very important port of Baltimore. The Army Corps of Engineers suggesting it could fully reopen the port by the end of May. And then there's the global trade element and angle. NBC's George Solis is with the president in Baltimore. He joins us now. George, uh, can you talk more about the president's conversation with those families? Every one of them, uh, they come from either Mexico or Central America. Hey, Tom, yeah, this is the president doing what he does, the consoler in chief coming to these terrible tragedies and hearing from them their loss, their pain, sharing those moments privately with them. He did share a quick anecdote during his remarks about one of the last messages that was sent via text by one of these workers to a girlfriend saying, we just finished pouring the cement. We are waiting for it to dry. And then, of course, we've seen the video and we know what happens next. I also, Tom, want to direct your attention to what's happening here on the ground in the Baltimore area. Behind me it is a memorial. It is a vigil that has been growing since the collapse, a large vigil planned for this weekend. Here are people from the community, family members, friends, stopping by to pay their respects to the men who lost their lives, those six lives lost, those four that are still unaccounted for. And very briefly, Tom, I want to tell you that earlier today I had a brief conversation with Julio Cervantes, one of the survivors of the bridge. He was actually in bed at home when I first approached the home, his wife telling me he had a chest injury. He answered the door today, seeming in much better spirits. He didn't want to go on camera and say anymore, saying there's still looking for some privacy as they're still mourning the loss of two of their family members. But it just tells you sort of the evolution and sort of the, the idea that the cameras may have left, but the pain is still all yeah. too real for those family members. So again, the president taking that time today to not only tour the wreckage and really see firsthand those harrowing images of the bridge no longer being there, but also talking with those family members and sharing their grief with them. And he's something he also addressed in his remarks that he understands the pain of loss as well, Tom. He does indeed, and he's talked about that, and it often helps families. George, thank you very much. George Solis in Baltimore for us. Uh, the Israeli military has now dismissed two senior officers and is releasing a new report on what it calls serious errors and violations that led to the deadly Israeli attack, which killed seven aid workers in Gaza. Meanwhile, the World Kitchen, World Central Kitchen, is now demanding an independent probe into those strikes, which Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu calls unintentional. Here in Washington, the Biden administration offering cautious optimism over Israel's new steps that would allow more aid to flow into Gaza, just 24 hours after the president gave Netanyahu an ultimatum to do more to protect civilians in Gaza or risk losing American support. NBC's Hala Garani is on the ground in Jerusalem. Hala, walk us through the latest on the Israeli military's mea culpa here and the removal of these officers. Is this significant or are these officers just kind of taking the fall? 
So you mentioned there that uh, uh, two officers were, were fired and that some military commanders were reprimanded. It's important to underline, though, that it doesn't appear as though any charges will be brought against them for what the Israeli military itself has called a grave error. It, is, it said that there was a case of mistaken identity that led to the uh, not one, not two, but three strikes against that World Central Kitchen convoy. Uh, and uh, therefore, it doesn't appear as though beyond this reprimand of the senior commanders and this dismissal of two middle-ranking officers, uh, at least uh, at this stage, there will be any consequences uh, for what the Israeli military uh, has acknowledged was uh, a mistake and a case of mistaken identity uh, that essentially is a tragedy for the people on the ground. But what uh, charitable organizations will uh, underline in this case is that this is not an isolated event. The Secretary General of the United Nations, for example, has said that almost 200 aid workers have been killed since October 7th. And so, therefore, that this is a wide wider problem that goes beyond the tragedy uh, that left seven World Central uh, Kitchen workers dead and that uh, a, a wider issue has to be addressed about how the Israeli military is conducting this operation that has led to these deaths and to the deaths of tens of thousands of Palestinians, including uh, pretty much all of the infrastructure of the Strip, at least in the northern part of, the, uh, of Gaza, Tom. Uh, Hala, has President Biden's ultimatum to Netanyahu, has that resonated with the Israeli government? Do they take him seriously or do they plan to just proceed with business as usual? Well, the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has done something he's resisted uh, so far, which is to open the Erez crossing. This is quite significant. It's in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. It's been closed since October 7th. But the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, like many others, is essentially saying, you know, we have to wait and see if the Israeli government follows through on these promises. Here's what he said in Brussels today. It's very important that Israel is taking full responsibility for this incident. It's also important that it appears to be taking steps to hold those responsible uh, accountable. As Israel pursues any military operations against Hamas, it has to prioritize the protection of civilians. It has to make that job number one. So we don't know exactly when these aid deliveries might take place uh, via the Erez crossing. Uh, there have been some reports that perhaps they could start on Sunday, but we're still waiting uh, for more information on that front. Tom? All right. Hala Garani, who's on the scene for us there in Israel. Thank you, Hala. To Wall Street we go now, where the stock markets uh, closed this Friday in the green after a March jobs report with a lot of superlatives. Experts are calling it stronger than expected, booming, eye-popping. Here's a check of the boards. The Dow closed 300 points higher on this Friday rebound, but at the same time, it registered its worst week this year so far. The S&P and the Nasdaq both up more than 1% on the day as well. Now, listen to this. Experts predicted the economy would add about 200,000 jobs in March. Instead, it was a stunner, a blowout. 303,000 jobs were added, 50% more than what the economists had expected. It is the 39th straight month, listen to that, 39th straight month of job growth in this country. No doubt it's a very good sign that the economy is on the right path and painting a very different picture from a year ago. Remember that? The consensus then was that a recession was imminent. NBC's Christine Romans is breaking all the data down for us. So, Christine, good news, good news, right? More people have jobs, wages are up, but good news can also be bad news if it means the economy is still hot, which keeps yeah. prices high, and therefore the Fed may not be in any rush to cut interest rates. Well, I mean, look, Tom, do you cut interest rates when the job market looks like this? I mean, you cut interest rates to goose an economy, right? You cut yep. interest rates when it needs a little bit of help. Uh, that does not look like it needs a little bit of help here. I mean, look at the job market just this year has actually accelerated. And the unemployment rate, you talked about all those superlatives, a soup of superlatives. Here's one, 40 or 28 months below 4%. 
percent for the jobless rate. That hasn't happened since the 1960s. Another period of a very, very strong job market. So look, I think six months ago, the feeling was, or even three months ago, the feeling was there'd be three rate cuts by the Fed this year um, to try to take some of that tightening off the table from all those rate uh, rate hikes. But what I see here is a job market that has absorbed all of those rate hikes and is still strong. Uh, and, and wages, 4.1 percent. You're so right to bring up wages. 4.1 percent, a little bit cooler than the month before. So maybe that gives some comfort to the Fed that it can just wait. It doesn't have to be cutting interest rates here anytime soon. You still have wages rising faster than your bills. And that's something that's, that's really, really important here. Yeah, but as you know, uh, <laughs> you know, that's not keeping up with inflation in the grocery store, right? So your wages are up 4% or so, but year over year or over two years, your grocery items are up like 30% or something like that. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. It's only recently that the wages have been steadily increasing and yeah. inflation has been tapering off. But there's three years of inflation scars, as I call them, uh, in the economy. So that may take time and honestly might take time. But we are starting to see it in some of these in some of these uh, 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 polls from people like this week or last week. The, you know, the University of Michigan poll showed that people 55 and older are starting to feel a lot better about the economy. Now, if you're 55 and older, what do you probably have more exposure to? A record high stock market and record high home prices, right? Yep. People who are younger, they are still dealing with a lot of costs and troubles in the economy. One of the reasons I think why the Biden administration is still going forward so aggressively with student loan forgiveness where they can, trying to alleviate some of the pain there for those younger people. Very good point. Absolutely. Christine, thank you very much. Appreciate the expertise. Nice to see you. Uh, the clock is ticking to get your Eclipse glasses and make your Monday afternoon plans because... As you probably already know, have you heard about it? A total solar eclipse is coming to America. It's a once in a generation, maybe a once in a lifetime event, when the moon fully blocks the sun's light and that creates complete darkness for just a few minutes. The path of totality you see there runs through more than a dozen states, turning them into huge tourist attractions. Let's bring in NBC's Priscilla Thompson, who's in one of those areas just out of Dallas, uh, Priscilla, Dallas is one of the first cities that will be in the zone, as it were, when this uh, eclipse starts in Mexico, right? And I hear tourists are flooding in already. Yeah, Tom, there are 83 counties here in Texas that are going to be in that path of totality, and tourists are already starting to make their way in. There's going to be huge watch parties, and uh, we have seen that hotels and rentals along this path of totality are almost entirely booked, including here at the Hotel Vin in Grapevine, Texas. They are doing a lot of specialty uh, foods on the menus, and of course, specialty drinks. We've got Patty and Daniel here, so really quickly, just tick through for me, what are these? All right, so we got the day and night drink, basically a chilton with a uh, black salt rim. Also got a rum mule, we're gonna call that dark and stormy. Got the ring of fire with vodka and a jalapeno vodka infused. And then we also got the Mai Tai. Uh, this is our totality Mai Tai, uh, traditional Mai Tai, uh, white rum, orgeat, uh, orange curacao lime juice and floated with the dark rum. And it gets a little something special there. Thank you. And so that is a taste of what tourists are going to be coming in looking to uh, get. We also spoke to the manager here about how they're preparing for this influx of visitors. And I want to play some of what he shared. We got international and domestic people are coming in, calling even till today uh, just to get the reservation in. So it is busy, right? We wanted to make sure what can we possibly do to curate an experience for each one of them that's coming in this whole weekend leading up to Monday. And Tom, guests here coming in for the Eclipse will also have an opportunity to take something back with them. The hotel has done these special bourbon, bottles of bourbon. They have spent three years working on that. So folks will be able to take that souvenir back. But it gives you a sense of just how long businesses here have been preparing for this incredible moment and this incredible influx of visitors to towns like this one. Tom? I think to do a thorough job, you ought to test out these uh, tourist attractions. I, I would just say off camera, but you know. I should, right? Okay. Yeah, well, off camera. <laughs> we'll do it camera. after my last live shot. I'll get a little sip. <laughs> hey, listen, really quickly. Some people are actually superstitious about a total eclipse, right? Yeah. 
Um, yes, that is a thing. And it's important to note that during an eclipse, some things might get a little strange. Animals might start acting a little weird, thinking that it's nighttime, preparing to go to sleep. But I will tell you, the thing that people here in Texas who are coming in to visit are bugging out about is the weather. It was supposed to have some of the best weather viewing, uh, best viewing, but now we're looking at cloudy weather and potentially uh, some storms here. So folks really hoping that that will hold off for those four minutes in that one o'clock hour on Monday yeah. so that they can see it in all its glory before that rolls in. Tom? All right, they can watch you right here on NBC News Now as well. Priscilla, thank you very much. We'll check with you uh, throughout the coming days. After the break from us, we'll show you some of the new documentary about Prince Andrew and the interview about Jeffrey Epstein that ended his royal life. And Tide Pods getting recalled because of dangers to children. You're going to want to see this. We're back. Stay with us. All right, let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a medical examiner is correcting the initial autopsy report for the pilot in that fatal Arizona hot air balloon crash. The original report said the pilot had ketamine in his system and the drug was not used in resuscitation efforts after the crash. But now county authorities say medics did in fact give him ketamine while transporting him to the hospital for resuscitation efforts. You'll recall four people died after the balloon fell roughly 2,000 feet back in January. Number two, the TSA tells the Washington Post that hundreds of people have bypassed airport security measures in the past 12 months. They're doing things like sneaking through ID checkpoints and going the wrong direction through one-way exit lanes. A TSA spokesperson says most of these were really bypasses that are rather rare, are inadvertent and unintentional actions by passengers. Number three, Procter & Gamble recalling more than 8 million defective bags of laundry detergent pods. The company says there is a packaging flaw that could hurt children. The effective products include Tide Pods, Gain Flings, Ace Pods, and Aerial Pods, made between September of last year to February of this year. P&G says there's been three reports of children ingesting contents of the laundry packets, no reports of injuries. Number four, 99 cents only stores are shutting down all 371 locations. The CSO, make that the CEO, says it's because of factors like the pandemic and shifting consumer demand and that it was, quote, very extremely difficult to make that decision. The chain will liquidate all of its merchandise. Number five, USC freshman Bronny James, LeBron James' son, will enter the 2024 NBA draft as well as the college transfer portal. Now remember, over the summer, Bronny suffered cardiac arrest while at a basketball workout and had to have a heart procedure that sidelined him for several months. And just a bit from us, our NBC News digital documentary showing a mother's fight to save her son held hostage by Hamas. And a decades-long case of stolen identity is giving shades of Don Draper. We're coming back. Bottom of the hour, and NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. It is awfully tough to read, watch, or listen to everything. So our bureau teams have identified some highlights. Here's what they say is going on down in their regions. We call the segment the local. All right, from our Midwest Bureau, a Wisconsin man has pleaded guilty to using a fake identity, listen to this, for more than 30 years. According to a plea deal, the man used the victim's identity in every aspect of his life. It was so convincing, the actual victim was falsely imprisoned for identity theft and ended up in a psychiatric hospital when a judge said he couldn't stand trial. Police figured it all out when they tested both men's DNA. Out of our Southern Bureau, police in Texas arrested a mother and daughter for allegedly performing, sorry mom, performing illegal butt injections across the U.S. without a medical license. You're not supposed to do that. Now, according to a court doc, the women tried to perform the service on a customer who was actually an undercover officer. Not a good move. They're set to appear in court next week. And from our Northeast Bureau, six inmates at one New York State prison will get to watch Monday's solar eclipse. Now, remember, they sued over the state's decision to lock down prisons during the eclipse for safety reasons. They argued it violated their constitutional rights. The prison says it's looking into other religious requests 
to view the eclipse. Now to new reporting from NBC News Digital Docs. Our team has been talking about and talking to one mother's fight to bring her son back home after he was taken hostage by Hamas back on October 7th. This is 23-year-old Hirsch Goldberg Poland in the nearly six months since her son was taken. Rachel Goldberg Poland has become a vocal advocate in the effort to free the more than 100 hostages still being held by Hamas, all while trying to pretend everything is normal. Today is day 27. Hershey's still not home. 52, 75, 86. Today is day 100 since my son was stolen from me. It's sad to be known for something really painful and really scary. And that's what people think of when they see me. Every time we spoke to anyone in the media, they would say, how many days has it been? So I just took masking tape and started to make these numbers. And it makes people really ask, how are we allowing this to continue to happen? The hostage families have to pretend to be normal if we want to function and if we want to save them. First thing in the morning, I always say to myself, and now pretend to be human. And I get out of bed and I put on this costume of being a person. I have a walk that I do now in the mornings that I've crafted so that I don't see anybody. And I walk with my head down and I always wear sunglasses. I often have a hood. If I see people in the distance, I cross to the other side of the street. And all day long, it's kind of like someone's holding a branding iron on your back and you can't let anybody know. I was asked early on if I would speak at the United Nations in New York. And so I did. Why is no one crying out for these people to be allowed access to the Red Cross? Why is no one demanding just proof of life? We felt that the advocacy for the hostage situation was so important that we really never wanted to say no. I've had episodes where I do break. It's better when I know that it's coming and I can, you know, say, I'll be right back and, you know, go to my room or go to the bathroom or go somewhere where it's not so public. But that's not the way trauma works. So there are definitely times where I'm out there screaming or crying or laying on the street. I'm also extremely heartbroken over the unbelievable suffering of hundreds of thousands of innocent Gazan people, what they are going through. It's unbearable and so painful to watch. Right now, there are hundreds of thousands of people suffering in this on both sides. And it's time for the suffering to stop. <laughs> On Shabbat morning, I sit down, cross-legged right in front of this big poster that we have of him that is behind our front door. And I look into his eyes and I talk to him and I tell him, you have to stay strong mentally, spiritually, psychologically, physically, religiously. You have to survive. You have no choice. We are coming. You can make it through this and you're gonna have a long, beautiful life. 
one mother. We'll be right back. Back now to an NBC News exclusive with the son of recording artist Sean Diddy Combs, also now accused of sexual assault. The new lawsuit first obtained by NBC News accuses 26-year-old Christian Combs of sexually assaulting a woman in December of 22. She says she thought she was being hired for a wholesome family excursion on a yacht that Diddy charted. Instead, she found a, quote, hedonistic environment. Diddy is named in the lawsuit as well, accused of aiding and abetting his son. In the last couple of hours, we've heard from a lawyer for Diddy and his son calling this a lewd and meritless claim from the accuser's lawyer saying father and son will file a motion to dismiss the lawsuit. Now, remember this moment from those dramatic police raids earlier this month at Diddy's home in Los Angeles and also Miami. Diddy has denied all allegations related to the wave of sexual assault and sex trafficking allegations that he faces. Chloe Malas joins me now. Chloe, what else can you tell us about this lawsuit against Christian and Diddy Combs? And did this come as a surprise? Nice to see you. I mean, this woman is accusing Christian Combs of an incident that allegedly took place in December 2022, just days before Diddy had a really big party on this yacht uh, for New Year's Eve. And the victim claims that she was drugged and sexually assaulted by Christian Combs. Again, Christian Combs' lawyer denying these allegations. Uh, she claims that there are also audio recordings that were taken by a music producer um, who was on the yacht, who was always recording uh, things that were going on and just happened to catch some of the exchanges between Christian Combs and this alleged victim that they believe backs up her claims. Um, NBC News has not been able to independ independently verify that. And in the lawsuit, there are also uh, photos of alleged bruises that she says uh, are, are because Christian Combs grabbed her. Now, all of this, um, you know, was taking place allegedly in December of 2022. And she claims that she was in a room and somebody came in, saw that this was a bad situation and that that kept her from being assaulted further and she was able to get out. And now she is seeking unspecified financial damages. Um, and again, we've seen that, uh, you know, Sean Diddy Combs and his son are both saying that they are going to fight this. And Diddy is included in all of this because he was the one that procured the yacht. Yeah, so walk us through again the allegations against Diddy and where the investigation stands right now. So I want to just go through this timeline that we have. So this all kicked off in November of 2023 when uh, one of uh, Diddy's ex-girlfriends, Cassie, uh, but her name is Cassandra Ventura, a well-known singer, and two others sued Diddy for sexual abuse, something that he uh, denied. Now, uh, you know, Sean Diddy Combs, he settled that lawsuit with Cassie like just about a day or so later for an undisclosed amount of money. Then December a woman comes forward, uh, you know, we don't know her identity, but claims that she was raped by Diddy when she was 17 years old. Um, and then another lawsuit, February 2024, from a former record producer who worked with Diddy on his love album, um, accusing him of all sorts of things, including assault. And then, like you showed, that footage, that unbelievable footage of Diddy's homes, multiple properties being raided by federal authorities last week. And he, Diddy has not been charged with anything criminally. We do not know what those federal investigators found and if they're ever going to reveal if anything was found. Um, and then obviously this lawsuit that NBC News has exclusively obtained. And so, you know, things are not looking good. And um, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the course of the coming weeks. Okay, Chloe Malas breaking the news. Thank you very much, Chloe. Coming up from Moss, ticket prices for tonight's women's final four through the roof. The NCAA's president says there is no peak to the sport's success. What about ticket prices? We're coming back. Okay, so we are just hours away now from the most anticipated women's final four ever. With four huge storylines about to play out in Cleveland tonight, there's the bracket, the opening game with South Carolina, the huge favorites against an upstart North Carolina State. Then the nightcap, a heavyweight bout with UConn's Paige Beckers and the superstar of this sport right now. You know who she is, Iowa's Caitlin Clark. Audience experts expect more than, more records, I should say, after 12 million people tuned in for Monday's LSU-Iowa game. 
with The Athletic predicting anywhere from 8 million viewers to nearly 17 million for the final if it's Iowa against South Carolina. NBC Sam Brock will explain how all of this turns into dollars for the athletes in just a moment. But let's start, though, with NBC's Jesse Kirsch, who's in Cleveland, uh, just outside the site of this year's women's Final Four. Boy, you got a rough assignment, buddy. You get you get to watch the Final Four. But this is <laughs> yeah, not Tom, just... I, I have a press pass that I think would be worth a pretty penny, but, of course, <laughs> ethics preclude me from uh, indulging in that. We're going to go in there in a little bit and check out these games. Uh, you just set the stage. We're looking at some powerhouse matchups and and the, the finale to what has been a historic tournament for the women's game. The NCAA says that each of the rounds in this championship leading up to this weekend have broken attendance records. And you just talked about Monday night, LSU, Iowa. It was a rematch from the, the, uh, the championship game last year. And there were more people watching that game than the championship last year. Just gives you an idea of the energy around these games. And like I just mentioned, it's not cheap to get in here. Take a look at some of these ticket prices. According to TickPick, this is the highest we've ever seen for an average ticket price for the women's final four. And the prices are almost double what they were last year. Just gives you an idea of how much excitement there is around this. We caught up with some NCAA officials earlier, including the vice president for women's basketball. Here's part of what she shared with us. Let's go. I think it's a combination of both, uh, you know, exposure through TV, but it's social media. Our players out there, their personalities are coming out. Um, we have great coaches that are faces of the game as well. The skill and athleticism on the court is phenomenal. These are great players, the basketball skill, the, the power that they have. We're looking at a lot of star power across this game, but of course, one name continues to stick out, Tom, and that's Caitlin Clark. Yeah, Jesse, I've got offers already coming in right now for your press pass. Text me right now. All right, buddy. Uh, we, listen, we should know the women are playing in a typical 18,000-seat basketball arena, right? We're not even talking about the men's Final Four playing in a 70,000 football stadium. So any talk about when we might approach parity? Yeah, so we, we talked to the NCAA uh, about this earlier. And remember, Tom, it was just a couple years ago that there was a lot of attention on a disparity between the weight room facilities, for example, at the 2021 tournament for the women versus the men. And the NCAA president and vice president we spoke with earlier talking about investment they've made to bring that parity to both the men's and the women's tournament. Uh, and they said that even with tournaments planned out ahead, uh, specifically San Antonio, they are looking at larger venues for the women. And of course, they plan these things out years in advance. Uh, but the expectation is that this game continues to grow for the women. Here's part of what the president of the NCAA shared with us earlier. I want to think about this as something where there is no peak, right? It's just going to keep going up. And the goal for all of us is to continue to make the investments to drive that. But at the same time, to be able to make the changes despite the fact that we have to plan many years in advance to be able to absorb and, um, and take advantage of that. No, and, and that's, of course, what we're talking about, in-person in attendance specifically. But don't forget, Tom, as you mentioned, talking about more than 12 million people that tuned in on Monday night for a quarterfinal. ESPN says that was the most watched women's college basketball game ever. we come on the air at this hour with breaking news. We are just now learning about a body being found and identified at the Baltimore Bridge collapse. We will bring you the latest on the ground about that story. New York City all shook up after that really surprising and rare earthquake sent tremors all across the Northeast. The strongest quake New Jersey has felt in 250 years. The stunning video and the after effects. Then the new jobs report came in very hot. Historic gains defined the expectations. Whatever happened to a recession? And how will the Fed now react? What about voters reacting to these strong numbers? Plus, our digital doc team knew heroin reporting on one mom's fight to bring her son, a hostage held in Gaza, to bring him back home. That is later in the show. Plus, the NBC News exclusive on the mounting charges coming now for Sean Diddy Combs and another member of his family, his son. And then there's the eclipse. You've heard about it. The countdown is on. We've got the latest on the preparations for this once-in-a-generation event coming up in just a couple of days.
Hey there, I'm Tom Costello. Happy Friday. I am in for Hallie, and tonight we are just learning in the last few minutes that a body has been found at the site of the tragic Baltimore Bridge collapse. That according to the family of the deceased. And it comes as President Biden makes a key trip to Baltimore to tour the wreckage today. He met privately with the families of the six men killed when that massive cargo ship plowed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge 10 days ago. And the president, late today, promising more federal aid is on the way for the city. Here's what he said. I'm here to say your nation has your back, and I mean it. Your nation has your back. So salvage and recovery teams are still working 24-7 to clear the tons of twisted metal and concrete from the waterway. Let's bring in NBC's George Solis, who's on the ground. George, uh, you have some details, right, about one of the victims, a body has now been discovered. Yeah, that's right, Tom. The brother of Maynard Sandoval Suazo telling me moments ago that the family was called in today saying that they did get confirmation that Maynard's body was found there at the wreckage of the bridge. They're saying that they have to get more details tomorrow after the body is processed, but this was sort of the update that they were fearing the most. Uh, they were expecting it, but obviously it's news that really resonates and hits heavily for this family as they were awaiting word if their loved one would ever be found. Some other details slow to come in at this moment, but again, the brother who I spoke with last week during the bridge collapse telling me he does leave behind a young family as well, and they were really praying that his body would be found relatively soon after this collapse, but they were among those other family groups, those four family members that were still waiting for any update. And again, telling me that this morning they were given a call to report to an office, an undisclosed location, and now confirming to me that they did find his body. And now again, they are waiting for that body to be processed. Uh, and we are awaiting more details about maybe where the body exactly was located. As we learned uh, during the initial recovery of two of the bodies last week. Some of those men were in vehicles. Not clear at this point if Maynard's body was in a vehicle at this time. Again, some of the details I'm working through with the family at this moment. But again, just a tragic update to an already tragic story. And it comes, as you mentioned, the president was here today meeting with those family members. And earlier today, I actually met with one of the survivors of the bridge collapse. Julio Cervantes, who was bedridden for a time after the collapse, after suffering a chest wound, Today, answering the door, still not commenting because they are still reeling over the loss of two of their family members, but he appearing to be at least in much better spirits and health after surviving that fall. But again, just a tragic update for the Suazo family, who again, telling us, telling NBC Today, that the body of their loved one was recovered, Tom. Well, I know his family in Honduras last week was, uh, was hoping that he would be discovered and brought back to Honduras. So there's some solace there. George, thank you very much, George Solis. All right, breaking right now, aftershocks being felt across the Northeast after that wild and rare earthquake that shook the area this morning. It is the strongest quake that the epicenter in New Jersey has seen in nearly 250 years. Take a look at this. What the f happened? Yeah, they're not used to earthquakes up in the Northeast. It was a 4.8. Magnitude quake centered just outside of Lebanon, New Jersey, just 50 miles or so outside of New York City. People reported feeling the shakes all the way from Philly up to Boston. In one New Jersey town, more than a dozen people were evacuated from buildings because of structural damage. Now, take a look right there. You see those houses kind of leaning together? That's what they're concerned about. Teams are out as we speak across the states checking to make sure that bridges and roads and buildings and tunnels, that they're all okay. As of right now, no reports of any injuries. The earthquake triggered ground stops at two major airports in the area, causing several flights to be diverted, Newark and JFK. Now, remember, this isn't California. It's scary for a lot of people in the east. The east coast, not known for this kind of thing. Many buildings aren't built for earthquakes. They're quite old. And that's raising a lot of concern about structural safety. We have meteorologist Michelle Grossman to break this down for us. First, though, let's go to Emily Aketa, who's on the ground there in New Jersey. Emily, you just felt an aftershock where you are right now. 
Yeah, that's right, Tom. Literally a matter of minutes ago, and this is something that officials have been urging people to watch for in the coming days. These continued aftershocks. We know there have been more than six at this point, and it happened to, it almost felt like a vibration of the ground. There's this moment where all of our crew here, we were looking around at each other like, did you just feel that? Did you just feel that? People start coming outside asking, did you just feel that? So this is a continued threat that people want, that officials want people to keep an eye on, though to a more minor degree compared to the 4.8 magnitude earthquake that really rocked this town in particular. And hearing from people, there was a lot of confusion trying to make sense of what could that have been. Some people thought their houses were collapsing or there was some kind of explosion because, as you mentioned, this is not something Northeasterners are familiar with. Now, what's happening right now, there are teams across the region from here, even 300 miles out, that are going around to different buildings, bridges, infrastructure, checking to see on the integrity of those things. That will continue to happen in the coming days. Here's what one woman told me about her terrifying experience. The whole entire house was shaking. I mean, pretty, pretty aggressively, the walls were trembling. And I, what instantly went through my mind was that I thought there was an explosion happening from the basement. And this is the strongest earthquake to hit the East Coast since 2011. And it is the strongest earthquake to hit New Jersey in nearly 250 years, Tom. Well, we've also had an online uh, frenzy, as you would expect. The Empire State Building account, its Twitter account, X, uh, playing it into saying, I am fine. Then just moments ago saying, not again with the aftershock. Uh, listen, this is serious, but it's also taking off in true meme culture fashion as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. True meme fashion culture. That's that's for sure. And you're seeing so much chatter on social media. I think because there are no reported injuries and there's no widespread significant damage that people are having a little bit more fun with it on social media. I've seen posts about T-shirts already coming out saying I have survived the New York City earthquake. Some joking that this earthquake merely knocked over a single chair, maybe some people wondering how Californians would be laughing at us in this moment right now. But I think, as you pointed out, that for so many people in the North, Northeast, unfamiliar with these kinds of situations. It was in the moment really scary and confusing as the ground rocked for seconds. Tom. Yeah, and let's keep in mind this is also an area that was hit on 9 11. So all of that's still very real for people uh, in the New York area. Emily, thank you very much. All right, let's go now to meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Michelle, we, we just talked about how this is taking off online with the jokes, but when you hear from people on the ground, they really felt this and they were they were really terrified. So why is it that that this doesn't quite stack up to the magnitudes of the quakes out there in California. And all those folks in California right now are just shaking their heads at us here in the Northeast. Yeah, we can almost hear it, right? Uh, well, we can tell them a few things because we are feeling it different than they would in California. There's three major reasons. And I know, Tom, you're a science nerd like I am and you really love this stuff. But this is really interesting. One of the major reasons is we have really dense rock as compared to the West. We have the Appalachian Mountains, which are way older than the Sierra Nevada Mountains, way older than the Rockies. So they They've been uh, exposed to pressure and temperatures and just kind of packed in. So it, those rocks and the crust is a little bit stronger, easily transmits this energy. So we feel it stronger and it transmits it even wider than it would in California. So you can look at some maps um, online where you see maybe an epicenter in California and, and the uh, length isn't as, as wide. But look at this in the northeast. You can see how far it goes. <coughs> and it can go 300 miles where we're feeling it. That's the first reason. The second reason was this was really shallow. So when you have a shallow earthquake, you feel it sooner and you feel it more because there's not a lot of space for that energy to go. It's going to go right to the surface. And then the third reason are the buildings, right? So in California, I was talking to Chase Kane, who is a climate specialist for our local NBC stations, and he said he's been through so many in California, but those buildings are made under a strict code where they tend to sway with the earthquake. Here, we don't have that. So we feel it more. You know, I heard some people where they felt their building shaking. They'd never felt this before. And keep this in mind, Tom, we felt it in 2011. We felt an earthquake in the 80s as well. But many people haven't, and they might not again, because this is the third strongest earthquake in New Jersey. Back to the 1700s, the 1800s, you have to go back. So they may never feel this again. And then let's touch upon what Emily said, because I think this is super, super important. We do have many chances for aftershocks. Uh, that's from the USGS. So what you want to do is drop 
cover and hold. If you do feel this, now statistically speaking, we're not gonna see a stronger one, but we could, but statistically that's 4%, but we do have a 48% chance of seeing a three magnitude or less. Back to you. You know, you just made a great point because New York City is built on unbelievably strong bedrock, right? I've yeah. been in the tunnels underground when they dug out a new subway. Yeah. Uh, and so when it's that hard, of course, if you start rattling and shaking it, it's going to really spread uh, through the region as opposed yeah. to something that's a little softer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, interesting stuff. Michelle, see, we geek out on nerdy stuff. Thanks very much. On a Friday. Mich <laughs> that's right. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Overseas now, Taiwan rescuers there facing threats of landslides and falling rocks as they try to save people trapped after an earthquake there off the island's eastern coast. We continue to see dramatic scenes, including this rescuer giving an injured man a piggyback ride out of a cave after he was stuck there for days. Rescuers have been combing mountainous areas like these for anybody left behind in the devastation. Earlier today, crews found two more bodies in the mountains. That brings now to 12, the number of people killed in that 7.4 magnitude quake in Taiwan. More than 1,100 people injured, 600 trapped, and at least 13 missing. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer is on the ground in Taiwan. We were inside Taroka Gorge National Park today, where for days rescue teams have been working to reach hundreds of people stranded in the mountains. They've been cut off by landslides. Helicopters have been taking supplies to them, things like food and water, to tie them over until they can be airlifted out. Most of them have been trapped at a hotel inside the park where they're said to be safe. But there are still several people who have been reported missing. Time is of the essence. That 72-hour window that rescue officials talk about maximizing, it's now beginning to close. Rain has come into the forecast, and the main challenge remains aftershocks. There have been more than 400 of them now and counting. One rescue team leader told us every time there is an alert, they need to retreat. And for the bigger ones, they simply go back to the station. Earthquakes are unavoidable here, but Taiwan has arguably one of the most advanced systems in the world to deal with them. There are cell phone alerts to uh, let people know what's happening, and as, as well as wide public awareness. People just seem to know what to do when an earthquake strikes. There are also strict building codes and lessons learned over the years uh, that have seen several buildings reinforced with steel beams to make them more resistant. You'll see all of the activity at this tilting building uh, behind me. For several days, it's been on the verge of collapse. Officials have made the quick decision that they're going to demolish it. Janice Mackey Freyer on the ground in Taiwan for us. Other news, the Israeli military has now dismissed two senior officers and is releasing a new report on what it calls, quote, serious errors and violations that led to the deadly Israeli attack, which killed seven aid workers in Gaza. Meanwhile, the world's central kitchen is now demanding an independent probe into those strikes. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu calls them unintentional, while here in Washington, the Biden administration is offering Cautious optimism, their words, over Israel's new steps to allow more aid into Gaza. Just 24 hours after President Biden gave Netanyahu an ultimatum to do more to protect civilians in Gaza or risk losing American support. NBC's Hala Karani is on the ground in Jerusalem. Uh, Hala, can you give us more information? What more do we know about how the world's central kitchen is responding to this, this report and just the devastating loss of these seven individuals? Well, you mentioned the World Central Kitchen demanding an independent, a fully independent probe into this attack that left seven of its employees, its workers, dead. We heard from the IDF spokesperson, Daniel Hagari, who added a little bit to the written statement that was put out today, taking full responsibility for the attack, calling it, as you mentioned there, uh, that uh, serious errors were committed. Daniel Hagari saying it was a terrible chain of errors.
and should not have happened and that the Israeli military is fully responsible. But for the World Central Kitchen, for other aid organizations, this speaks to a wider problem. These seven people who died on April 1st are not the only humanitarians who've lost their lives since October 7th. As the U.N. Secretary General mentioned today, almost 200 humanitarians have been killed in strikes and in the violence since October 7th. Uh, and uh, this is an addition, of course, to the tremendous loss of civilian life. So the aid organizations are saying that now more needs to be done, not just to protect humanitarian workers, but to get that desperately needed aid into the Gaza Strip in a much more seamless fashion, and that the Israeli government has to do more to facilitate that, Tom. And Hala, give us an update on the aid that is supposed to be flowing into Gaza with famine striking much of that region and the death toll is surpassing 30,000. How long could that aid actually last? Right. So we're not sure exactly when uh, what the Israeli uh, government has promised will happen will materialize, that the air is crossing in the north is meant to reopen. It's been closed since October 7th, that the Ashdod port is meant to be used. These are according to, to the statements from the Israeli government over the last 24 hours following that what was described as a tense phone call between President Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister. But um, look, uh, in the past, the Israeli government has promised, you'll remember a few weeks ago, to flood the North with aid. That didn't happen. The Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is also saying that, uh, you know, uh, we need to see on the ground exactly what transpires before making a judgment as to whether or not the Israeli government has fulfilled its promise. Listen, he was in Brussels today. It's very important that Israel is taking full responsibility for this incident. It's also important that it appears to be taking steps to hold those responsible uh, accountable. As Israel pursues any military operations against Hamas, it has to prioritize the protection of civilians. It has to make that job number one. So again, we're waiting to see when and uh, aid will go through and how many trucks, how many vehicles will be allowed in. Uh, that's something we're gonna be keeping a close, uh, close eye on, Tom. Hala, we really benefit from your expertise and your intimate knowledge uh, of the situation on the ground. Thank you very much. Hala Garani. To Wall Street we go right now, where the stock markets closed this Friday in the green after a March jobs report with a lot of superlatives. Experts are saying it was stronger than expected. It was booming. It was eye-popping. Yeah, that's all true. So here's a check of the boards. The Dow up 300 points on a Friday, a rebound there, but at the same time, the Dow also had its worst week in 2024. The S&P and the NASDAQ up more than 1% today. Experts have predicted the economy would add 200,000 new jobs in March. Instead, the stunner, 303,000 jobs added, 50% more than what economists had expected. It is the 39th straight month of job growth in America. No doubt, it's a very good sign that the economy is on the right path, painting a very different picture from a year ago. Remember, we were talking then about a recession being imminent. NBC's Christine Romans is, of course, breaking it all down for us. Christine, good news, good news, right? More people have jobs, wages are up, but good news can also be bad news if it means the economy is still hot, which keeps yeah. prices high, and therefore the Fed may not be in any rush to cut interest rates. Well, I mean, look, Tom, do you cut interest rates when the job market looks like this? I mean, you cut interest rates to goose an economy, right? You cut yep. interest rates when it needs a little bit of help. Uh, that does not look like it needs a little bit of help here. I mean, look at the job market just this year has actually accelerated. And the unemployment rate, you talked about all those superlatives, a soup of superlatives. Here's one, 40 or 28 months below 4% for the jobless rate. That hasn't happened since the 1960s. Another period of a very, very strong job market. So look, I think six months ago, the feeling was, or even three months ago, the feeling was there'd be three rate cuts by the Fed this year um, to try to take some of that tightening off the table from all those rate, uh, rate hikes. But what I see here is a job market that has absorbed all of those rate hikes and is still strong. Uh, and, and wages, 4.1%. You're so right to bring up wages. 4.1%, a little bit cooler than the month before. So maybe that gives some comfort to the Fed that it can just wait. It doesn't have to be cutting interest rates here anytime soon. You still have wages rising faster than your bills. And that's something that's, that's really, really important here.
Yeah, but as you know, uh, you know, that's not keeping up with inflation in the grocery store, right? So your wages are up 4% or so, but year over year or over two years, your grocery items are up like 30% or something like that. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. It's only recently that the wages have been steadily increasing and yeah. inflation has been tapering off. But there's three years of inflation scars, as I call them, uh, in the economy. So that may take time and honestly might take time. But we are starting to see it in some of these in some of these uh, 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 polls from people like this week or last week. The, you know, the University of Michigan poll showed that people 55 and older are starting to feel a lot better about the economy. Now, if you're 55 and older, what do you probably have more exposure to a record high? stock market and record high home prices, right? Yep. People who are younger, they are still dealing with a lot of costs and troubles in the economy. One of the reasons I think why the Biden administration is still going forward so aggressively with student loan forgiveness where they can, trying to alleviate some of the pain there for those younger people. Very good point. Absolutely. Christine, thank you very much. Appreciate the expertise. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, the clock is ticking to get your eclipse glasses and make your Monday afternoon plans because as you probably already know, unless you're living under a rock, a total solar eclipse is coming to America. It's a once in a generation or maybe even once in a lifetime event when the moon fully blocks the sun's light, creating complete darkness for a few minutes. The path of totality, here it is right there, running through more than a dozen states, turning them into huge tourist attractions. Let's bring in NBC's Priscilla Thompson in one of those areas just south side of Dallas, Texas. She's left the bar that she was in an hour ago, and now she's out on the street. Um, hey, Priscilla, Dallas is just one of the first U.S. cities, right, that will be in the zone. So how are they preparing? Yeah, Tom, we're out on the streets with the people. These downtown streets in Grapevine were bustling earlier today. There are folks already starting to trickle in, and those numbers are going to continue to grow on Saturday and Sunday as Texas is expecting more than one million visitors to see this beautiful eclipse. And I spoke with Elizabeth with the Chamber of Commerce here about how this town is preparing and, and what this means, what the impact could be. I want to play some of what she shared. Yeah. How big of a boon do you think this will be for businesses here? Yeah, we're going to have thousands of people from all over the world, all over the country here. And so everyone's really excited. They're all excited to see the eclipse, but also to have all these visitors here shopping, eating at the amazing restaurants, having lots of fun. And there are 83 counties in Texas in the path of totality. You can imagine how many visitors they're going uh, to be seeing. We've seen already that rentals along that whole path of totality from Texas to Maine are nearly completely sold out. So certainly a big economic boom for small towns like this one and larger ones like Dallas. Tom? Yeah, this path of totality sounds so ominous, doesn't it? But listen, uh, even if you aren't in that path of totality, uh, people across the country can still get a glimpse of it. Maybe not a full exposure, but they can get a glimpse, right? So what should they keep in mind? Yeah, some folks in New York City will even be able to see a little bit of it. And the big thing to know is that if you were staring up at the sun, you've got to make sure you've got your glasses and you want to make sure that they have that indicator on there, that they are certified glasses, the real deal. You can pick them up at places like Target, Walmart, even some local libraries. And certainly if you're going to an Eclipse event, they will likely have them there as well. Tom? Hey, Priscilla, really quickly, uh, zoom in to that little logo that we need to see on the glasses so people can know what should yeah. they be looking for. Let's see that. Have your photographer move in a little bit, a little right bit, a little there. bit. Okay, that's what you should be looking for to make sure that your glasses are legit. Because last time we had a lot of fraudulent glasses out there. Got it. All right, yeah, Priscilla. Yeah, want to be aware of that. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, Priscilla, on the ground in Dallas. Coming up, the new trend at airports. Kind of freaking out the TSA. That's in the five things. And LeBron James's son wants his own shot at the NBA. Why he is declaring for the draft after his rough freshman year. We're coming back. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a woman convicted of killing and poisoning her friend with eye drops has been sentenced to life in prison. 
Prosecutor said she was the caregiver for the woman she killed and was motivated by greed during her sentencing. Earlier, she said investigators got it wrong. Number two, a federal appeals court says that the Justice Department can reopen its investigation into the National Association of Realtors Pro policies. It comes years after the group settled government antitrust claims. The group tells Reuters today that the government should be held to the terms of its contracts. Remember, last month, they agreed to a huge settlement in a big antitrust lawsuit on behalf of home sellers. Number three, the TSA tells the Washington Post hundreds of people have bypassed airport security measures in the past 12 months. They're doing things like sneaking through ID checkpoints and going the wrong direction through one-way exit lanes. A TSA spokesperson says most of these rare bypasses are inadvertent and unintentional uh, actions by the passengers. They don't mean any harm. Number four, 99 cents only stores are shutting down all 371 locations nationwide. The CEO says it's because of factors like the pandemic and shifting consumer demand and that it was an extremely difficult decision. The chain will liquidate all of its merchandise. Number five, USC freshman Bonnie James, LeBron, James' son, will enter the two, make that the 2024 NBA draft, as well as the college transfer portal. Now, remember, over the summer, Bronny suffered a cardiac arrest while at a basketball workout. He had to have a heart procedure, and that sidelined him for several months. Coming up from us, a deadly truck crash in Bolivia. What we're learning now about the driver, he may have fallen asleep at the wheel. And college athletes are navigating confusing new rules about how they can get paid. The one school trying to make that a lot easier. Stay with us. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it's tough to read, watch, or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for both you and for me. Here's a look at what they're watching. We call the segment The Global. We start in Bolivia. At least 14 people are dead, two others injured after a crash involving a bus and a truck carrying salt. Local police arrested the truck driver, one of the only survivors. They think he may have fallen asleep at the wheel. In Russia, emergency services say a dam burst in the Ural Mountains forced a big evacuation. Something like 4,000 homes could be inundated. The area is dealing with just a ton of flooding caused by melting snow from the nearby mountains. And in the UK, the Guinness Book of World Records says this 111-year-old man is the oldest living man. His name is John Tenniswood. He was born in 1912, before the First World War. He says his long life is, quote, just luck. Tennis would earn the title after the previous record holder, a 114-year-old man in Venezuela, died earlier this week. Now to new reporting from NBC News Digital Docs. Our team has been talking about and talking to one mother's fight to bring her son back home after he was taken hostage by Hamas back on October 7th. This is 23-year-old Hirsch Goldberg Poland in the nearly six months since her son was taken. Rachel Goldberg Poland has become a vocal advocate in the effort to free the more than 100 hostages still being held by Hamas, all while trying to pretend everything is normal. Today is day 27. Or she's still not home. 52, 75, 86. Today is day 100 since my son was stolen from me. It's sad to be known for something really painful and really scary. And that's what people think of when they see me. Every time we spoke to anyone in the media, they would say, how many days has it been? So I just took masking tape and started to make these numbers and it makes people really ask how are we allowing this to continue to happen the hostage families have to pretend to be normal if we want to function and if we want to save them
first thing in the morning, I always say to myself, and now pretend to be human. And I get out of bed and I put on this costume of being a person. I have a walk that I do now in the mornings that I've crafted so that I don't see anybody. And I walk with my head down and I always wear sunglasses. I often have a hood. If I see people in the distance, I cross to the other side of the street. And all day long, it's kind of like someone's holding a branding iron on your back and you can't let anybody know. I was asked early on if I would speak at the United Nations in New York, and so I did. Why is no one crying out for these people to be allowed access to the Red Cross? Why is no one demanding just proof of life? We felt that the advocacy for the hostage situation was so important that we really never wanted to say no. I've had episodes where I do break. It's better when I know that it's coming and I can, you know, say, I'll be right back and, you know, go to my room or go to the bathroom or go somewhere where it's not so public. But that's not the way trauma works. So there are definitely times where I'm out there screaming or crying or laying on the street. I'm also extremely heartbroken over the unbelievable suffering of hundreds of thousands of innocent Gazan people, what they are going through. It's unbearable and so painful to watch. Right now, there are hundreds of thousands of people suffering in this on both sides. And it's time for the suffering to stop. <laughs> on Shabbat morning, I sit down, cross-legged right in front of this big poster that we have of him that is behind our front door. And I look into his eyes and I talk to him and I tell him, you have to stay strong mentally, spiritually, psychologically, physically, religiously, you have to survive. You have no choice, we are coming. You can make it through this and you're gonna have a long, beautiful life. One mother, we'll be right back. Back now to an NBC News exclusive with the son of recording artist Sean Diddy Combs, also now accused of sexual assault. The new lawsuit first obtained by NBC News accuses 26-year-old Christian Combs of sexually assaulting a woman in December of 22. She says she thought she was being hired for a wholesome family excursion on a yacht that Diddy charted. Instead, she found a, quote, hedonistic environment. Diddy is named in the lawsuit as well, accused of aiding and abetting his son. In the last couple of hours, we've heard from a lawyer for Diddy and his son calling this a lewd and meritless claim from the accuser's lawyer saying father and son will file a motion to dismiss the lawsuit. Now remember this moment from those dramatic police raids earlier this month at Diddy's home in Los Angeles and also Miami. Diddy has denied all allegations related to the wave of sexual assault and sex trafficking allegations that he faces. Chloe Malas joins me now. Chloe, what else can you tell us about this lawsuit against Christian and Diddy Combs, and did this come as a surprise? Nice to see you. I mean, this woman is accusing Christian Combs of an incident that allegedly took place in December 2022, just days before Diddy had a really big party on this yacht uh, for New Year's Eve. And the victim claims that she was drugged and sexually assaulted by Christian Combs. Again, Christian Combs' lawyer denying these allegations. Uh, she claims that there are also audio recordings that were taken by a music 
music producer um, who was on the yacht, who was always recording uh, things that were going on and just happened to catch some of the exchanges between Christian Combs and this alleged victim that they believe backs up her claims. Um, NBC News has not been able to independ independently verify that. And in the lawsuit, there are also uh, photos of alleged bruises that she says uh, are, are because Christian Combs grabbed her. Now, all of this, um, you know, was taking place allegedly in December of 2022. And she claims that she was in a room and somebody came in, saw that this was a bad situation and that that kept her from being assaulted further and she was able to get out. And now she is seeking unspecified financial damages. Um, and again, we've seen that, uh, you know, Sean Diddy Combs and his son are both saying that they are going to fight this. And Diddy is included in all of this because he was the one that procured the yacht. Yeah. So walk us through again the allegations against Diddy and where the investigation stands right now. So I want to just go through this timeline that we have. So this all kicked off in November of 2023 when uh, one of uh, Diddy's ex-girlfriends, Cassie, uh, but her name is Cassandra Ventura, a well-known singer, and two others sued Diddy for sexual abuse, something that he uh, denied. Now, uh, you know, Sean Diddy Combs, he settled that lawsuit with Cassie like just about a day or so later for an undisclosed amount of money. Then December a woman comes forward. Uh, you know, we don't know her identity, but claims that she was raped by Diddy when she was 17 years old. Um, and then another lawsuit, February 2024, from a former record producer who worked with Diddy on his love album, um, accusing him of all sorts of things, including assault. And then, like you showed, that footage, that unbelievable footage of Diddy's homes, multiple properties being raided by federal authorities last week. And he, Diddy has not been charged with anything criminally. We do not know what those federal investigators found and if they're ever going to reveal if anything was found. Um, and then obviously this lawsuit that NBC News has exclusively obtained. And so, you know, things are not looking good. And um, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the course of the coming weeks. Okay, Chloe Malas breaking the news. Thank you very much, Chloe. Coming up from Moss, ticket prices for tonight's women's final four through the roof. The NCAA's president says there is no peak to the sport's success. What about ticket prices? We're coming back. Okay, so we are just hours away now from the most anticipated women's final four ever. With four huge storylines about to play out in Cleveland tonight, there's the bracket, the opening game with South Carolina, the huge favorites against an upstart North Carolina State. Then the nightcap, a heavyweight bout with UConn's Paige Beckers and the superstar of this sport right now. You know who she is, Iowa's Caitlin Clark. Audience experts expect more than, more records, I should say, after 12 million people tuned in for Monday's LSU-Iowa game with The Athletic predicting anywhere from 8 million viewers to nearly 17 million for the final if it's Iowa against South Carolina. NBC's Sam Brock will explain how all of this turns into dollars for the athletes in just a moment. But let's start, though, with NBC's Jesse Kirsch, who's in Cleveland, uh, just outside the site of this year's Women's Final Four. Boy, you got a rough assignment, buddy. You get you get to watch the Final Four. But this is <laughs> yeah, not Tom, just... I, I have a press pass that I think would be worth a pretty penny, but, of course, <laughs> ethics preclude me from uh, indulging in that. We're going to go in there in a little bit and check out these games. Uh, you just set the stage. We're looking at some powerhouse matchups and, and the, the finale to what has been a historic tournament for the women's game. The NCAA says that each of the rounds in this championship leading up to this weekend have broken attendance records. And you just talked about Monday night, LSU, Iowa. It was a rematch from the, the, uh, the championship game last year. And there were more people watching that game than the championship last year. Just gives you an idea of the energy around these games. And like I just mentioned, it's not cheap to get in here. Take a look at some of these ticket prices. According to TickPick, this is the highest we've ever seen for an average ticket price for the women's final four and the prices are almost double what they were last year just gives you an idea of how much excitement there is around this we caught up with some ncaa officials earlier including the vice president for women's basketball here's part of what she shared with us Let's go. 
I think it's a combination of both, uh, you know, exposure through TV, but it's social media. Our players out there, their personalities are coming out. Um, we have great coaches that are faces of the game as well. The skill and athleticism on the court is phenomenal. These are great players, the basketball skill, the, the power that they have. We're looking at a lot of star power across this game, but of course, one name continues to stick out, Tom, and that's Caitlin Clark. Yeah, Jesse, I've got offers already coming in right now for your press pass. Texting me right now. All right, buddy. Uh, w listen, we should know the women are playing in a typical 18,000 seat basketball arena, right? We're not even talking about the men's Final Four playing in a 70,000 football stadium. So, any talk about when we might approach parity? Yeah, so we, we talked to the NCAA uh, about this earlier. And remember, Tom, it was just a couple years ago that there was a lot of attention on a disparity between the weight room facilities, for example, at the 2021 tournament for the women versus the men. And the NCAA president and vice president we spoke with earlier talking about investment they made to bring that parity to both the men's and the women's tournament. Uh, and they said that even with tournaments planned out ahead, uh, specifically San Antonio, they're looking at larger venues for the women. And of course, they plan these things out years in advance. Uh, but the expectation is that this game continues to grow for the women. Here's part of what the president of the NCAA shared with us earlier. I want to think about this as something where there is no peak, right? It's just going to keep going up. And the goal for all of us is to continue to make the investments to drive that, but at the same time, to be able to make the changes despite the fact that we have to plan many years in advance to be able to absorb and, um, and take advantage of that. And, and that's, of course, what we're talking about in, in person attendance specifically. But don't forget, Tom, as you mentioned, talking about more than 12 million people that tuned in on Monday night for a quarterfinal. ESPN says that was the most watched women's college basketball game ever. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.